Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Pursuit of Cabin Living series by Four Expedition. I'm Scott Luthold. In this episode, we continue on with the renovations of our tiny cabin here in the Rocky Mountains to get it ready for winter. We think winter could probably come earlier than usual. It's early September right now. We're expecting snow possibly yet this month and probably some in October. We have about five to six weeks left of work to do on this cabin. We're hoping to get into it and live in it by uh, Halloween of this year, so October 31st. In this episode, we finish up the framing on our interior. We learn how to do some rusted corrugated for our roofing. And we take a nice little drive down into the valley to a beautiful little farm and do some raspberry picking. It was, it's been a really wonderful week. We've really enjoyed what we're doing here. I really hope you enjoy this episode. So sit back and enjoy the ride. Morning, my friends. Today's an exciting day. We're going to do the interior framing today, and we may even cut the uh, log between the cabin and the addition. So we might need to do that in order to frame out the doorway. So we're going to get started. <laughs> We just made a last minute decision to put in a stackable washer and dryer. We weren't going to have one, but we decided to make the bathroom a little bit smaller, the closet a little bit bigger, and now we're not going to have to go to the laundromat in the winter time. We, we are not going to have to go to the laundromat. I said we. I said we. She's not going to have to go to the laundromat. Thank you, boys. <laughs> okay, come in the house. Hey, honey. Hey, honey. Oh. Hi. Oh, you need a shower. You need to go in the shower. I'm in the shower. Bathroom. I should have gone to the bathroom first. Yeah, probably should have, but at least you're going to wash your hands when you're done. Hey, burn that poop because we're getting incinerator toilet. Come over here, wash my hands because you got to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom. Want me to do the laundry? Yeah, for, yeah, let's see you do the laundry, which guys, it's probably never going to happen, but. We're going to have a washer and dryer back here. In the back of the closet, and this is the closet, into our bedroom. I God love it. Bless Texas. Thank you for finding a spot for the washer and dryer. Because you're going to do the laundry half of the time, right? Oh yeah, I'm going to burn the. Oh, yeah. I'm going to burn the laundry in the incinerator toilet. Okay. Well, we're taking a short break, but we have this framing almost done. It's really exciting because, you know, when I first considered buying this cabin, I stood out here in the grass and I staked down a couple of stakes and then I took a piece of string and uh, kind of drew out what I thought the bathroom and, the, and the, um, the closet and all that would look like. And it's so cool to finally see it come into fruition and see it take form. I mean, I've, I've had probably six or seven houses built in the past, usually tracked homes in Arizona, and everybody else is doing all the work, and there's no real planning that goes into it because you usually would pick a, a floor plan. This is something I'm doing completely on my own, which I think is really exciting. Heather and I are learning along the way. It's just, I just it's invaluable experience that we're, we're gaining here, and we're going to be able to use this experience to build other other structures in the future for ourselves. So it's really exciting. Oh my gosh, this is awesome! It's and awesome, look, isn't it? Yeah, it looks so much bigger once there's like the walls and stuff. Yeah, and this bedroom is huge. It's a huge. It's yeah. I just measured the width of it's almost 12 feet, 
Wow. And then, of course, the length is 16 feet. So wow. 12 by 16 is the master bedroom for this little cabin. And we're getting a washer and dryer. Yeah, it's funny. We on the fly making decisions like that, whether or not we want to have a washer and dryer. I'm really glad we're choosing to do that. And because we chose to do a washer and dryer, we decided to make the bathroom just a tiny bit smaller and the closet a tiny bit bigger so we could um, we could accommodate for that. So uh, that's one of the neat things about being able to build this yourself. You can make those decisions as you're putting up the walls. Well, my friends, it's a very exciting day today. <clears throat> we just passed Labor Day. It's Wednesday today and we are going to be doing something really, really cool. We are cutting the logs between the cabin and the addition today. So our cabin's gonna go from 327 square feet up to 647 square feet in a matter of minutes. Super exciting, we don't have our door in yet, we don't have our windows in yet, but we're gonna cut that through so we can get some things done. We'll probably have to uh, put some plastic over it or something like that, but what an exciting day for us today. We're also gonna be finishing up the interior framing and then after that, uh, we're gonna get a phone call probably around noon. There's a metal shop that we ordered all of our corrugated uh, roofing from. And so what we decided to get was raw steel corrugated, so it rusts. And then once the windows come in on the 24th, after that we'll start the stonework on the exterior front. And then on the sides, we already, as you know, we already got the, the rough sawn pine, we'll be installing that. And then we will be focusing on the interior finishes. So we're really excited about that. So we've been looking on Wayfair and different websites for um, showers and bathroom tile and tin ceilings and all sorts of things that are gonna make this cabin look so, so incredibly cute. Today's the day we say goodbye to this solid wall. We are cutting the door through this wall today. Woohoo! Come toward you. Yeah, but it's not cut up through the top yet, right? The top's not cut, but it doesn't need to be. Yeah. We're gonna it'll knock out most of it. Bah! Okie dokie. Go in there by that saw. between the 44-year-old cabin and the brand new addition. One of the nice things about being involved in doing this yourself is that you can make sure that you have everything the way you want it. As you see right here, I put this 12-inch board in here. I'm gonna put another 12-inch board down below it and two 12-inch boards right here because that's where we're gonna put a 70-inch television in our bedroom. And, you know, if you're not building this yourself, you don't have the ability to put these kinds of things in. So, really cool. Over here in the hallway, we're gonna put a wood beam across the entrance to the bedroom with a T above it. So I'm gonna reinforce on the walls here to be able to hang that beam. Heather over here is putting some spray foam in. <laughs> Warmth, Warm yep. for the winter. Closing, closing up any gaps between the addition and, and the log wall there. And so, the woodpecker yeah, and the woodpecker holes. Yeah, we have some woodpecker holes that were up here on the wall. We're gonna fill those in too. We don't want bugs coming in from inside the wall. But if you look here, you can see that there's these gaps going up the wall between the addition and the logs. So we're gonna fill all that in with spray foam. And then of course, we're gonna be covering this anyway. So I'll probably design this so that it, it does seal that up pretty well. But nonetheless, we're gonna spray foam all that. I've had a couple people ask me lately what I'm going to do with this channel series once we're done building the cabin. 
Well, first of all, this property has a lot of construction yet to be done. I plan on building the barn next year. I'll be sharing all that with you. In a couple of years, I do plan on building a larger home, I think, on this property. If we don't do that, that's something I really do want to do. But if it's if for some reason we don't do that, we may opt to buy another piece of property in a lower elevation so that we have a winter camp as well as a summer camp. That's a possibility, and I'd be sharing all that with you. And if we don't do any of that, and we choose just to live in this small cabin and have the barn, we will get back to all of the outdoor adventure that I've always been filming, from overlanding to backpacking to fly fishing, snowshoeing, snowmobiling, and all of that. There will be a ton of outdoor adventure activities that I continue to film, and also some inspirational stuff that I really want to get into. I do want to finish writing my book. And I do intend to invite people to this property for nature submersion, outdoor adventure workshops and things like that. I consider these videos to be my art form. I had planned on writing a lot more books than the first book I wrote. And I, I have to say, I have found my medium in video because I feel like with the videos that I share, if I feel inspired by what I create, I know that will translate to inspiring all of you. So we decided to come out and check out a nearby barn just to see how theirs has weathered. And I don't think they've done anything to the exterior of this barn. It's probably been sitting here for a good, I bet you, 20 years. But here's the vertical rough sawn pine. They don't have any batten in the middle. We're going to cover ours with something right here. And the reason that there's gaps here is because these were probably milled and hung up right away and not kiln dried, so they shrunk. We're deciding whether or not we're going to oil it, put a light stain on it, or maybe a, um, an opaque watered down paint or something to get a look. But if you look here, as you go down, this is the area that gets splashed by rain and has snow sitting against it in the winter time. But we do like this look here because it looks like it's an old weathered mining building. I do think this was stained or something. You think? Yeah, because look at that. That yellow. Like that. You think it's stained? Or maybe oiled? It's stained or sealed with just something. So you're on the sharp edge because of that. My lip is up. Okay. So you would leave it so we can walk between. All right, so here's our ridge cap. We've got three of those. And then here's our gables. We've got a bunch of those. And then here's our drip edge. And here's our full sheets of corrugated. And these are 30, did you say 37 inches? 37. They're 37 inches long, or wide. And then they're 16 feet long. We only need about 14 and a half, 15 feet. So we're gonna be cutting these shorter. And uh, of course you don't really have 37 inches. You have to overlap a couple of the ridges. So that's why we have so many over here. All right, so we got all the corrugated laid out. Next step is going to be to clean all the oil that comes with these off of them because they put a layer of oil on them in order to keep them from rusting before they're sold. So we got to clean all that off. After that, we'll figure out what we're going to do to make them start rusting. So over here, I'm doing some work something new that I learned. When I put my shiplap on this wall, and I put my shiplap on this wall, this wall will have an end piece here, a two by six, in order to be able to nail the shiplap to. But on this wall, there wasn't anything because the 16 on center joist ends way back there. So what I was told to do, or somebody suggested I do, was add some two by sixes to the back of this two by six joist here in order to be able to create a surface here on this end to be able to nail my um, my tongue and groove or my shiplap, whatever I decide to do there. All right, so while I've been finishing up on the framing, Heather's been over here applying a degreaser. Let's just take a look at what she's got going on. How you doing? Not fun? Not fun? We need a pressure Pardon? We need a pressure washer. Well, pressure washer or water. So we're cleaning these steel sheets today and they have oil on them. So we're taking a pressure washer with soap in it to get the 
to get the oils off. The soap is a degreaser, so that helps. Something like Dawn does a pretty good job. But what's interesting is we're out here on this property and we don't have a well, we don't have running water, so we have no water pressure. <clears throat> and we really only have limited amounts of water. So I wanna show you something that we did in order to be able to take care of that situation. So we borrowed this Ryobi pressure washer from a good friend of ours here that lives in the neighborhood. And uh, he also loaned us this hose. And we have it connected up to a 275 gallon water tank. Now what's interesting about it is that the Ryobi will suck the water out of the water tank. However, we had to run a siphon. And because the, uh, the hose is pretty big and we couldn't really suck on that hose long enough to get a decent siphon, um, generally speaking, what you have to do is you have to fill the hose completely with water, stick it down in the, uh, the main reservoir and make sure that that reservoir is higher up than where you're draining into. However, we just didn't have enough suction with our lungs to be able to suck that out. So what I did was I took my, um, we took our shop vac here and we used the shop vac to pull water through the hose to get it full. Um, and then I hooked that up to the Ryobi right there. And sure enough, it worked. Thankfully, it's a wet dry vac. <laughs> All right, so this morning we went into town, we got ourselves the solution that we need to make this corrugated rust. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that this morning, tell you all about how that's done and show you the process. Should be pretty cool. I'm excited about it. Heather's really excited about it too because it's something that happens right before your eyes. Yesterday, we spent the whole afternoon pressure washing all of these sheets in order to take off the, um, the oil that comes with them from the factory and uh, really was an arduous process. And uh, we did get it all done, as I showed you a little bit ago. Some of the uh, the pieces are starting to rust. All right, so this is the stuff that we got. We got three gallons of vinegar. We got a, as much hydrogen peroxide as we could find in town. We got some iodized salt, and we got two types of sprayers. We got a one gallon sprayer, and we got a handheld sprayer. We're gonna talk a little bit about what the mixture is and why. So look what she's got over there. She's using. The big guns. Now look what I got. Like what the heck? You said we only needed one sprayer. So our first application is to put the vinegar on. Which and is the I would, etching. What's that? Which they call the etching. Yeah, the etching. Oh. I would highly oh, recommend. Easter egg. <laughs> <laughs> Easter eggs. Woo! It does smell like Easter eggs. I highly recommend you get one of these one gallon sprayers because as you saw, my hand's already tired from spraying one. This is two gallons, by the way. It's probably time to go get a beer for me and she can do all this. So the reason we decided not to get two of those sprayers is because I'm cheap. <laughs> so there's a couple different mixtures that they recommend for doing this. One of them has an acid, and then the other one has hydrogen peroxide, um, salt, and vinegar, the way we already showed you. And we chose to do that method because we, don't, we didn't really want acid chemicals spreading around our property. Now there will be salts and some hydrogen peroxide, but uh, that's a much better solution than having acid around the yard. These are our last five. Mm -hmm. Pretty shiny, looking good. All right, ready for the science. We're gonna put the hydrogen peroxide in, the salt in, and then add a little bit of vinegar and go over all these again. And we should see rust almost immediately. As long as Heather knows what she's doing. Well, I don't, so <laughs> fingers crossed. All right, so these are each two. Dun, 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 dun. All right, everybody have your answers? Uh-huh, I'm gonna be assaulted here. You're getting assaulted? <laughs> Where's the uh, tequila and the lime? Right here. Oh, you got the shot glass. Crystal skull shot glass. The vinegar. 
for every cup, we need one teaspoon of salt? Yes. Okay. So two, four, six. So that's, we need that many. Talk about precision. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna put them in here. Once we put this in the oven, no kids are allowed to run around the house. Hey, we have an oven now. We do. How many was that? My mama always said, don't run around the house when you put a cake in the oven. I think that was too. This is how I mix drinks. Yeah, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is a measuring line on here. That's really good. Make sure you use your home-style ranch dressing jars. Better measured. Oh, look at that. You're almost as anal as I am. I aim to please for you, love. Oh, I'm pleased to aim. Sure. Oh, wait. Leave oh. me with the explosives. <laughs> it's, they're sealed. Put it in a glass. Oh. Gosh, like we live in the mountains here. Did you grow up in a barn? <laughs> you drink your hydrogen peroxide out of the bottle? They made these childproof. I can't get it. My turn. Oh, there we go. Pour this whole thing in here. All of it. Is it going to explode or bubble over like one of those volcanoes? <laughs> like a volcano? I don't know. We'll find out. Where's your eye protection? You got that stirred up yet? Oh, crap! Oh, there goes the crap sheet. Crap sheet. This whole project's a crap sheet, or crap shoot. This doesn't, this doesn't dissolve together, maybe. Careful, careful. God, I wouldn't want to be in chemistry class with you. Just pour it in there. Rather than pouring the last one in. Ah! Kaboom. Wait, I have safety goggles on, it's okay. I'll probably let you get the salt off. Thank you. in there. All right, let's do this. All right, here we go. I don't know how quick this happens. I don't see anything. Oh, there we go. Whoa, there we go. It was just not mixed, I don't think. Maybe shake that once in a while because of the salt and everything in the bottom. <laughs> wow, Dirty Harriet, that's cool. All right, so we did the ridge caps. Wow, these came out great. So what's really interesting is you walk around them, depending on where the sun's hitting, you get different lighting. So here they are looking east. The sun's behind me, nice and dark. These came out pretty good. We do need to probably put another coat on some of these and we ran out of hydrogen peroxide. In fact, we actually used up all the hydrogen peroxide in the entire community. We went to every store and we bought them off of every shelf. And then it turns out I had a bottle in the RV and I knew I had another bottle somewhere and I found a bottle in our storage unit here on site. But as you can see here, there's still a lot of gray showing on these. Now, again, dependent on how you stand, like this one, like see this one, you see some gray on these. As you walk around them, look how much darker they get when you're looking straight on. And as I move around the side here, they get light again. So nonetheless, we need to do a whole nother coat on all of this, but we're making some really great progress. Well, good morning. We're gonna head down south today. We gotta go into town, one of the towns nearby, and get some more supplies to continue this rusting process. 
we're probably going to need another three gallons of vinegar and probably another three gallons of hydrogen peroxide. We already have enough salt. But um, yesterday I, I had a little bit of uh, vinegar left over. So I went over the already rusted uh, boards with vinegar on, on, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, seven of them. And it gave it this really unique look. And so we think we might go down, get plenty of supplies so we have enough, and then go over all this stuff again. So that's what we're going to do today. And once that's done, hopefully we'll get, uh, we'll get started putting these up on, on the roof. I'm really excited to see how this looks on the roof. I have always wanted a property, a cabin, somewhere in the woods that had this sort of awesome old, old west looking building, mining, sort of like a mine shaft mining building type look. And that's what we're going for here. For now, we're probably going to keep the uh, the one inch standing seam roof that's on the main cabin, mostly because it's a very expensive roof and it's a very durable roof. It won't necessarily match, but because it's tan, it's not really going to be much of a clash. So I think we're going to keep that for this winter. And then, you know, who knows? We'll either keep it that way, we'll figure out how to rust that existing roof, or we'll eventually exchange that for another roof to match this. So that's what we're up to today, and uh, we're going to get started. Whoa! Good with a bobcat. That's good. That's good. And he's off. Farewell, Bobcat. <laughs> do a turkey first. Once you do a turkey, then you do it. Oh. Ah! How do you just go high pet? Some pressure on the breeze. On the white piece? This is exciting. This is cabin life. Cabin life right here. So <laughs> this is how many bags per pallet? 40? 50. Oh, it's 50. 50 40 pound bags. Okay, we got 50 port 40 pound bags per pallet. Yeah. So we got a hundred bags. It costs us around five hundred and twenty-seven dollars including shipping and tax. Or delivery and tax. Yep. And we calculated that out if we ran this for seven months, it's about two dollars and 50 cents per day to heat the house. Now, our pellet stove has an eco mode. We can probably set it to, you know, this is a pretty good sized stove for a little cabin, so we're probably going to be able to set it, I would say, in the 60s. It, high 60s. The high 60s. High 60s. Yeah, so it's got an eco mode, so it controls the distribution of the pellets in the auger, and uh, I'm sure that we may even end up with a little left over at the end of the year. Who knows? But this will be our first year to, to gauge it and test it out. So for about 52 years, I have been a major disliker of country music. That and rap music. I don't play any country music or rap music. Never been a fan. But I have to say that there's a couple people around here. This one here included. That's getting me a little turned on to country music, believe it or not. Never, ever, ever thought I'd see that day. <laughs> but thank God I'm a country boy. Anyway, if you haven't uh, been listening to country music much, and you're like me, you loathe the fact of country music, and it makes you sick to your stomach, uh, well, I have to tell you, 
I'm really into the guy named Chris Stapleton. Good musician. Yeah, true. She likes him, and I like him. And uh, that's a big testament to um, that country musician, Chris, because to convert somebody like me, who is just not somebody who's ever liked country music, to all of a sudden liking country music. And a little bit has to do with our friend uh, Joe, one of our neighbors that's been kind of introducing me a little bit more and more to country music as well. But uh, I have to say, they got a couple of his songs going through my head right now. And in fact, all night long last night. Um, Tennessee Whiskey's one of them. What's the other one that I really like? Not by him? No, by uh, Chris Stapleton. Tennessee Whiskey's the one. And then starting over. Oh, starting over. Starting over. Check out uh, Chris Stapleton starting over, and then um, Tennessee Whiskey, his version of it, which is really great. And who's that other guy that I like that has a chew tobacco, chew tobacco, chew tobacco spit? <laughs> Blake Shelton. Oh, Blake Shelton. What's the name of the song? Boys Around Here. Boys Around Here. I, I think, think it I is. Think. Yeah. Yeah, that one's a that one's a guy song. <laughs> totally. Talk about girls. Talk about trucks. Chew tobacco. Spit. <laughs> Whatever it is, but now I got these songs going through my head. Oh. So the guy that delivers all of our stuff from the local lumberyard, his name's Lenny. Kind of a retired guy. He only works part-time over there. He delivers a few things here and there and does a little bit of work. Really great guy. Anyhow, he's an expert with elk calls and other kinds of wild game calling and so forth. And so we got to talking, and he and his wife are going to come out here one of these days. We're going to have some elk steaks and he's going to teach me how to use his calls anyway so um last time he was here he said he was going to bring me one of his calls and so that's what we were doing over there when he showed up and this is the little device that he's got here and uh he brought me one and i made sure that it wasn't a used one <laughs> anyhow you take this thing you put it in your mouth and I'm, I'm not very good at this i just started obviously just today <laughs> Pretty cool little device. So on our way down to the valley, we decided to stop here. There's a little raspberry picking place. And this is definitely raspberry picking season, so we're going to check it out. You go back out where you came in, make a right, and it's you'll see all the cars. Is everything, <laughs> is everything good? Oh, very good. Right. There's brisket. Um, That's what smelled good. Load baked potato, loaded baked potatoes. Uh, there's turkey breast. Mm -hmm. Oh my lord! And raspberry Fantastic. sundae. And raspberry, and raspberry sundae. Yes. All pie. right. We'll Just do that. all kinds of pie. Ah, yeah. Raspberry pie. So raspberry pie. So it's all good. Awesome. All right. Thank you. So we are starting at 11:30 with an empty bucket. Let's see. Look at. <laughs> Heather's favorite. Wow. Awesome. Look at all the people out here today. Enjoying a Saturday picking raspberries. Most of us take it for granted. You know, we're on this ball of rock out in the middle of billions of square miles of, um, you know, just darkness. And there's stars, yes, and all that, but it's like 
we're on this planet here that's just a miracle, just like a true miracle. The fact that we can walk around and just pick something off of a bush and put it in our mouth and eat it. It's like, and, and this stuff here, this is like candy. I mean, it's, a, it's like walking, this is like Jolly Ranch. You know, you're picking <laughs> Jolly Ranchers and just eating them. It's, it's, un, it's unbelievable. And I really, I think most of humanity takes that for granted, especially considering when you, you know, buy most of your food at the grocery store and somebody else is taking care of all that for you. It allows you to not have to think about where your food's coming from, how it was harvested and all that. But when you get out here and start harvesting it and picking your own stuff, it just opens your eyes to just how incredible this planet really is. All right, so how did we do? Amazing. Uh, wow. What are we gonna do with all those? So it took us half an hour to pick all of these. What are we gonna do with them? Put them in my belly. <laughs> um, probably eat a bunch of them on the way home. Yep. Yeah, Cause they're a good snack. Yep. And then maybe we'll make raspberry cobbler. Oh, or raspberry pie. In our new oven. In the new oven, in the cabin. We have no countertops, but that's okay. We'll just make it on the floor. Definitely on the floor. Little dirt doesn't hurt. Little dirt doesn't hurt. I'm gonna call you Veruca Salt. Veruca? Veruca Salt, yep. The blueberry girl? The blueberry girl. You're gonna mm -hmm. turn into a raspberry before we get out of this field. <laughs> Look at all these raspberries. Alright, so on three we're each gonna take a big handful of raspberries and shove them in our mouth. Ready? All these are gonna fit in our mouth. <laughs> no. Ready? <laughs> One, two, three. Wow. <laughs> nice. That probably only included two spiders, maybe a bee, and some other little bugs. Good protein for lunch. We got this 275 gallon tank recently. Bought it from a friend and down here, there's this valve opening on it. And as you saw in our previous earlier video, we had to create a siphon in order to be able to use it. So we decided to go down to a hardware store and see if we could find some connections to make this work so that we could connect a hose right to that valve. We went to the hardware store yesterday and the guy, he said, uh, we talked to a guy that worked there and he said that he had done about 17 of these, right? Right, well, I think he said more like 100, but <laughs> anyway. All right, so we got all these cool parts. Let's see if any of these fit. I mean, of course, we have to glue these things together. And... Yeah, using cement. Does it fit? Oh, look at that. Oh, nice. It fits. Cool. Oh. So that'll be cemented on. <clears throat> yeah, this one cemented in. Then we got this little guy. Oh my God. Screws on the end there. Very cool. This was crucial. That was a crucial piece, yeah. So I think it's this. Yeah, there you go. And then this right here. <laughs> oh my gosh. No Sweet. More, no more sucking with the vacuum. Look at, Look at that. that. All works great. So, um, you know, when this thing's filled with, uh, you know, gallons and gallons and gallons of water, that creates downward pressure. So we'll now have water pressure coming out the bottom here to be able to um, to use this to spray things down. So I'm gonna make Scott work this morning a little bit because I'm still eating breakfast, enjoying these wonderful raspberries that we got at the raspberry farm yesterday. <laughs> so get to work, honey. All right, let's do this. Let me start in the back. In the shade? In the shade. <laughs> this one's done. Yes. So we got what? Three more gallons of vinegar. So we don't have to be sparing because the more we do, especially on our second process, that's what really makes the amazing, beautiful rust. Correct? Correct. So again, the vinegar etches the metal. So we've already gone over all this with the whole process and it didn't go dark enough on a lot of it. So now we're etching it more 
with the vinegar. So you put that on, it helps etch the metal, and then we'll do the second process. All right, so while I've been over here spraying these down, Heather's been over here testing the different stains and finishes that we're thinking about putting on our rough sawn pine. So let's take a look at what she's got. <laughs> All right, so what you got? Okay, these are our three colors we're trying out here. Natural, Mission Oak, and Charcoal Gray. So this is a UV protectant. Everybody keeps saying we need to do something on our board and batten so it doesn't warp, and then it's going to shrink eventually because this is not dried. So we want to put some protectant on here. So we're trying to pick a color that kind of goes with the cabin, but still looks old. So these are our choices. Yeah, and we also wanted it to continue to weather. Yes, yes. By the sun and rain so and not, snow. We don't want to do a stain and a polyurethane and all that because right. we do want it to continue to age. What brands are these? This one is UV Plus. So it helps with protection, but also still allows it to, you know, get a little bit of aging, but we don't have to do it every year. Like some Thompson water seals and stuff you have to do every year. Right. Or every other year. So this is a longer term solution, which allows it still for us to get the cool colors over time. All right. So here's the Thompson water sealed. And there's the others that have the three different colored stains. Check it out. We're going to put this right back here. And look at that. Like that, stand back. What's it like when you're way back there? If I stand back. Can you see it or you want to pull it up? No, I can see it. Put it up against the house. Yeah, the cabin. See, to me, let me zoom in here. See, now the gray doesn't look bad. Yeah. I think you need to come back here and take a look. In the bright sun, the middle looks less brown and a little bit more weathered gray. It kind of does. So I think we're good with that middle. All right. This is the three techniques that we did. The roller. The roller. This one was done with a rag and this one was done with a brush. The roller ends up with more coverage? Yeah. What was the middle one? The middle one, this is a rag. Okay. And that's a brush. And that's a brush. So I put these here just because otherwise you see the difference. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good though. So, I mean, at the end of the day, they don't really look that much different. I would say that the roller definitely has a little bit more to it. Mm -hmm. so, of course, the roller is the easiest, the quickest for us. Yeah. Um, and then it's really easy to get the edges with the rag and stuff. That would be really hard, but we should get all the edges when we're yeah. you know, sealing it. Yeah, I mean, all three of them match some log on the side of the cabin. The middle one and the top one definitely, to me, match the logs better. But I'm also wondering if the bottom is going to lighten up uh, in the sunshine over time. Yeah, and these are wet. They'll dry, you know, a little bit. Lighter, yeah. But also we have to remember, brushing it on, you're like getting nothing in the wood. Yeah, you know, that's true. soaking in a little bit more. That is soaking a little more. And like we said, we can use a different roller too. We don't have to use something so nappy. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. I think those look good. Okay, so we picked Mission Oak. Okay. Mission Oak for sure. The application of it is still questionable, but... <laughs> Nice. You know, when you're working on these cabin projects, you spend a lot of time not really talking and just doing a lot of thinking, a lot in your head. And, you know, uh, a number of things came to mind that I wanted to share with all of you before we wrapped up this video. And I'm, the first thing is, and I'm sure most of you know this, it's always been this way, but times are changing. And uh, I had some interesting experiences this week. We were at a restaurant down in the valley earlier this week and just minding our own business, eating some tamales and uh, met this couple sitting next to us. They started chatting with us and they were from yeah, from the local area, I guess. And we talked for about a half an hour and had a really nice conversation. And then another couple showed up. And that uh, second couple that showed up kind of changed the dynamics of the conversation. And it turned out that the woman of the second couple, she was uh, in communications having to do with um, the pandemic. That shifted the other couple's conversation quite a bit. And it turns out that the original couple, the woman that I had been talking to and Heather and I had been talking to the whole time, turns out that she's the former um, attorney general for the state of New Mexico, retired from that. And we went on to talking and went on to talking and it turned out she shared with us that she now, instead of being the attorney general, 
is a lobbyist for Pfizer. So she's a politician in the state of New Mexico, and she's chosen now to lobby for a pharmaceutical company. That, to me, is frightening. The deals that are probably being made between these pharmaceutical companies and politicians and state governments and federal governments and all that is, to me, fairly alarming. And so being where I live now in the mountains, out in a remote location, in solitude, peace and quiet, a very small community of people, for me, I think, is is probably the ideal situation for the time being. And, you know, frankly, I've seen a lot and heard a lot of commentary about the real estate market being a bubble again. I don't su- I don't suspect that the real estate market's going to crash the way it did last time. I suffered pretty significantly from that. Uh, it cost me a marriage. It uh, cost me, I had three homes at the time. It cost me two of my homes. It was a very challenging time and it opened up my eyes a great deal to what's important in life and what's worth following and chasing, what kind of dreams and um, you know attainable things and things that allow you to become more free. To me, time is more valuable than anything. If you're able to find true love within yourself and true love in another person and share love with other people and spend most of your time doing that, you will find your life to be completely enriched. You will look back on your life in the future and truly believe that the way you lived it was worthwhile and it had meaning and purpose. A lot of people sit in the cities and they're hooked on their conveniences and television watching and their routines and they go to work every day in order to be able to pay for that lifestyle. And to each his own, I have no problem with that. If that's how you feel like your life should be uh, spent and you feel fulfilled, great. But if you feel like you are in some sort of a monotonous routine and you're not feeling like expressing love and you're not receiving love, you, you feel like you're wasting time well, then you have to make a change. You want to feel healthy? You want to feel fulfilled? You want to feel emotionally strong? Express and share and spread love. That's really all That's all there is to it. And do that in every bit of your daily work. Heather and I, we get up in the morning. We're excited to see each other. We have our coffee and we have a little breakfast. And we're excited to get outside and work on this cabin. And every single minute of working on this cabin, even if we're hot and sweaty, even if I smash my finger with a hammer uh, or I cut something crooked three times, it's still all being built with love. And we're spending quality time doing it. So this winter, when we're living in this little cabin and enjoying each other's company and we're cozy and warm and looking outside at the beautiful snowfall and birds flying around and and deer grazing and, and looking for sustenance in the winter time, we're going to feel very fulfilled that we spent our time doing something we really loved to fulfill a dream and every nail that went into the the construction of this, every bit of time spent rusting the roof, every bit of time insulating and digging holes and doing all those things will have been spent expressing love for what we were doing, for each other, for nature and our surroundings and for our community. So if you're not feeling fulfilled, there's a way to achieve those uh, very necessary emotional requirements. And I consider those to be requirements in life. And if you need some help with that, reach out to me. Go to fourexpedition.com and fill out the contact form and, you know, ask me some questions. Uh, If you're looking for some guidance, let me know. I'm more than happy to help because this is why I'm here. This is why I'm doing all of this. I'm doing this to, to, to create just a happy, fulfilled life, to in, influence and inspire all of you to, to, to go after your dreams and do something that's really meaningful and live life with me, meaning and purpose. So that's what it's all about. All right, my friends, I think that's it for this episode of the Pursuit of Cabin Living series by 4Expedition. I really hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed creating it. If you haven't become a subscriber to the 4 Expedition channel, I encourage you to hit that subscribe button. Of course, be sure to hit that notification bell down below to be notified of upcoming videos. And if you consider yourself to be an adventurer and you're looking for an adventurer community, 
Consider joining Team 4X by going to forexpedition.com slash join to learn more. Until the next time, take care. Thank <laughs> you.